So far in these videos, I have only talked about characters from long RPGs, main characters that have upwards of 40 hours to develop, and some of whom have sequel games that add on to that total. How then can a character whose game lasts only 10 hours achieve that same level of character development and achieve great character status? I would point you to Wandersong for an example of how to write an incredibly good protagonist in a shorter game with its main character, the Bard. The protagonist who is not the hero, who solves problems in unconventional ways and yet accomplishes what no one thought possible. As usual, the first section of the video will be detailing the story arc of the character focusing on important character events, and the second will be talking about how they relate to other important characters. In the Bard's case, those characters will be Miriam and Audrey. By the way, I will be referring to the Bard as the Bard throughout this video since you get to name them, so I don't want to pick any particular name, although I chose Bard in my playthrough. I also will be referring to them by the pronouns they them theirs as the developer has stated they are non-binary, although he has said that any pronouns are fine, so don't feel bad if you've been referring to them using other pronouns. Let's get started, shall we? Wandersong has a lot of elements subverting the traditional hero's journey, because that's not the bard's tale, and that subversion starts out early on in the game. In a dream sequence, the bard receives a magical sword with all the triumph of a usual hero's journey, but the entire time they're wielding it, they look uncomfortable, and when an enemy appears and they try to swing the sword at it, they lose the sword because they are not the chosen hero. Even worse than that, the bard is told by the messenger from Aya, the goddess, conducting the trial that the world is ending. The bard was not chosen by the sword. They're not the hero. So what can they do? Well, before the bard can worry about what they can do to save the world, they have some other problems to deal with, as their hometown of Langtree is being haunted by ghosts that can be calmed only by the bard singing. After pacifying all the ghosts, the mayor jokes that bards may be useful after all, and asks if the bard can go to the spirit world and commune with the overseer spirit to find out why the ghosts are haunting Langtree. In order to do this, the bard learns the Overseer song and travels to the spirit world where they once again meet the Rainbow Messenger. This time, the Rainbow Messenger tells the bard there is one way they could avoid the end of the world, by singing the Earth Song. It's so not that easy though, since the bard will have to travel to every overseer in the land and learn the pieces of the song that each of them knows to put it all together and then sing it. In fact, no one has accomplished this feat before. Complicating matters is the fact that the Dream King, Langtree's overseer, is singularly unhelpful to the bard's efforts. On the plus side though, the Dream King does give the bard the ability to communicate with spirits, so that's good. World's still gonna end though. If the theme of adventures not going the way they usually do in stories hasn't become apparent to you, I'm sure it is now. The bard, though, is too determined to let a little setback like failing to get one of the essential parts of the puzzle to save the world stop them. So the bard uses their newly acquired spirit language powers to find out that the ghosts are actually departed loved ones of the people of Langtree, and finds a way for them to coexist with their living relatives. Then, after a brief venture into politics, it's time for the first meeting with one of the most important characters in the bard's journey, Miriam. Miriam is a witch who saw the bard's display of spirit eloquence and rightly concluded that they had been to see an overseer, and she asked the bard to come with her. Miriam, along with her grandmother Safi, divined that the world was going to end and would like to prevent that, but have had little luck in their efforts thus far. Therefore, Miriam begins to travel with the bard at her grandmother's insistence, and we get lots of fun contrasting personality moments between the two. It's in this act where the bard's personality and core beliefs are established. The bard is a pacifist, and a good one at that, managing to resolve the issue with a troll with singing alone instead of resorting to Miriam's blast him approach. Once the bard and Miriam reach the next town, we get more glimpses of the bard's empathy and kindness, especially when dealing with the sadness and crippling shyness of Ash, a local musician who the bard tries to get to join 
they're banned. It is then through the Bard's thoughtfulness and support that not only Ash, but all the members of the band get together and give an amazing performance. I won't go into detail, but the Bard basically does this sort of thing with a group of people in every act from here on out. Afterward, the Bard learns of where the gate to the spirit world is near the town and heads off to talk to the next Overseer. This time, the Overseer is much more persuadable, and the Bard gets their first piece of the Earth Song. The Bard uses their new powers to help free the troll's boyfriend, and it's a very telling song for the Bard's character. They've always been dismissed by people because they're just a Bard. But with the world ending, this Bard is stepping up because for once, they want to be the hero. The journey seems to be on track again. The Bard befriends a pirate's crew, Miriam is still grumpy, and now the Bard is off to see the next Overseer. However, this is a game that likes to subvert expectations, and this act introduces the biggest one. As the Bard is about to meet the next Overseer, a mysterious figure cuts down the Overseer with the sword from the opening dream. This person is Audrey Redheart, aka The Hero. Her task? to kill all seven of the Overseers to stop their growing corruption, and in order to bring about the end of the world as ordained by the goddess Aya. Now, if that revelation wasn't devastating enough, Aya's messenger appears to tell the Bard that the Earth Song won't work, and their efforts so far have been futile. As the Bard says, so I was supposed to give up and just let the world end? The answer is, frankly, yes. The world ending is how it was meant to be, how it has always been. The Rainbow Messenger is sorry about it. Audrey, on the other hand, digs in the knife dismissively and then finishes the bard off with her final line, how about you leave it to the real heroes? And when the bard in anger starts towards Audrey, she blasts them with her lightning sword. This is the bard's lowest point and sends them into a deep depression. Up till now, the Bard has been relentlessly positive and determined, and the blows of learning that they were not the hero, and not even a hero. They were not expected to succeed, the world is going to end, and the actual hero just shot them with lightning, takes away all of that positivity and determination. Good thing the Bard has Miriam there to cheer them up in her own blunt way. Plus, given the Bard's ability to communicate with spirits, they still get the next piece of the Earth Song from the now deceased Overseer. Hope is not entirely lost, but it's hanging by a thread. Before getting into the next part of the Bard's journey, another disclaimer. I am not a mental health expert and do not personally have depression. Having said that, it seems clear to me that the Bard slips into a deep depression after the events of the previous act. While the Rainbow Messenger tries to get the Bard to perk up, the Bard is still struggling. They can't sing properly, they aren't motivated to interact with people, their enthusiasm for everything has been smothered. Good thing the environment in the town in question suits the Bard's mood, with the whole town in a depressed and hopeless state due to the overwhelming control and general lack of consideration of the factory and the town. In order to continue the journey, the Bard needs to find the joy in life again, so they can sing the Overseer song. The old saying, to help yourself help others, applies perfectly here, and once the Bard starts gathering a group to take on the Baron controlling the factory, they start to perk up and feel hope again. Once they've succeeded in showing the Baron the error of his ways, the Bard is back in business. A lot of the time in life and fiction, positivity, hopefulness, and kindness are shown as weaknesses. The Bard in this chapter shows why those qualities are in fact strengths and why the ability to continue on when all seems lost and to encourage others to not give up as well is the Bard's greatest strength. Being positive, being hopeful, and being kind are hard to maintain, and sometimes even the strongest people fall into holes of depression and hopelessness. Through time, personal work, and solid connections, it is possible to climb out of that hole, and the Bard doing that in this act reinforces how important those values are to them and shows why they press on in their journey. However, 
The journey will not get any easier, as demonstrated by the hero showing up and killing the next overseer at the end of this act as well. Miriam does prevent the hero from killing the Dream King, who had evaded the hero before, but the world is in a precarious position now. Everything is playing out still in accordance with the usual rules of the hero killing the overseers and Aya destroying and remaking the world. As Miriam says then, we have to break the rules, and that's another theme of the game. Breaking the rules, or more accurately, challenging the way things are always done. This theme is at its peak in this act, as the bard has to challenge the usual manner of things on a personal and country-wide scale in order to avoid catastrophe. That means pairing up with the hero to help achieve their goals, and getting into the middle of a war between two kingdoms in perpetual conflict, although that one was less by choice than by happenstance since the bard can talk to the ghost of Princess Hala, who is trying to broker peace between the two kingdoms. Princess Hala's journey in this act, in fact, mirrors the bard's journey on a wider scale. She is trying to do something people say is impossible, breaking with her kingdom and family to try and restore peace. Her actions, though, made the war worse, and now she's trying to fix it with the bard's help, and she fails at first. Later on, with everything on the line, though, Hala's message, amplified by the wishes of the people of the kingdom, finally gets through to their leaders and brings about peace. Wonder if that parallels any other story arc going on in the game. Hmm. While this is going on, the bard makes it to the spirit world and rescues two fairies from the crazed sun and moon overseers. The hero does not react kindly to this interference and blasts Miriam with her lightning sword, and the overseers destroy each other in battle. The hero then leaves the bard with the wounded Miriam and a parting shot. You don't belong in this story. With Miriam getting incapacitated and leaving to look after her grandmother, the bard will continue to the next overseer on their own. For the next act, the important part comes as soon as the bard finally reaches the overseer. The bard gets trapped and just as it seems they're about to get eaten, the hero shows up to save the day! Unfortunately, she tries to do it by drinking the potion of power Miriam and the bard made earlier. It doesn't go well, and the hero and the bard get trapped below the ice, and the hero's sword is lost. Down in the cave, after Audrey has a bit of a breakdown, the bard and Audrey have an actual conversation, which will definitely be talked about in the character comparison part. Audrey has given up hope. But this is the bard we're talking about. No situation is too dire for their indomitable spirit. Well, actually, first, the bard and Audrey have a moment of sympathy for each other. They have both been jerked around by the rainbow messenger and insecure about their usefulness. Their difference, the big difference, is that the bard is continuing on because they believe it's the right thing to do. Audrey is continuing on because she believes it's the thing she has to do. She is the hero, and killing the overseers is what the hero does. But over their conversation, it seems the bard gets through to her. They use the same appeal they used to the Dream King earlier. If there's a chance they can save the world, shouldn't they take it? Then Deus Ex Bugina happens, and the bugs arrive to help them get out of their sticky situation. At least, they arrive to help out the bard. If Audrey wants to come along, the Bard wants Audrey to promise not to end the world in order to give the Bard the chance to save it first. As the Bard says, If I help you escape, and you kill the last Overseers, it'll be my fault. I could save the world right now. When she finally promises, they proceed onwards. Not that they're on great terms, but the Bard and Audrey are working together in agreement. They manage to recover the sword, stun the overseer, and start the singing process, but just when it seems to be succeeding in bringing the overseer back to sanity, the hero swoops in and kills the overseer. Unsurprisingly, she lied when she made the earlier promise, and now there is only one overseer remaining. The hero's actions even cause the rainbow messenger to be scared of what she's becoming and support the bard more. The final act has begun, and they go back to the start in Langtree. 
Along with a recovered Miriam, the bard goes to see the final living overseer and confront the hero. Despite the impending end of the world, the Dream King is still not helpful, but gives some insight that the true end is everyone losing hope, including the Dream King himself. Well, if there's one person that's not going to lose hope, it's the bard, then the hero comes and kills the Dream King. Or it seems, but then the Dream King is back, and the bard and Miriam have to protect him from the hero to keep a chance of saving the world. Eventually, Miriam manages to grab the sword from the hero, and she rants at them for stealing her quest, her story, and her title as the hero. Something that she was absolutely concerned about, which is why she dismissed the bard earlier with the you don't belong in this story line. The bard tells Audrey that she is special, regardless of whether she is the hero or not. It's too late to reach her, though and she steals the sword back and ends the world. As the world collapses and gets sucked into oblivion, the bard sings one last song, along with all the people and creatures they met on their journey, in unison, in harmony. It's not the Earth song, it's something entirely different. In the end though, it's enough, and the world is saved. The bard's journey from a simple bard living in a small village to the hero, not in capital letters, that saves the world is complete. To use the Bard's own message to describe them, the Bard isn't special because they are the Bard, the protagonist or any other title. They are special because of their unique kindness, empathy, determination, hopefulness, courage, charisma, and strength. They accomplished what no one thought was possible, and in doing so rewrote the book on what is meant to happen, because they refused to believe it had to be that way. That doesn't mean they didn't have insecurities. Just take the early line from the mayor about bards not being useless after all. It's a complisult, part compliment, part insult, that is significant because the bard at times views themselves the same way. The journey wasn't easy, and there were moments of depression and hopelessness, but that made the ultimate achievement all the sweeter. And you know, saving the world is its own reward. In addition, the Bard is a unique character to be the protagonist of a video game. As a pacifist, they are at odds with the vast majority of video game protagonists. Since Wandersong sought to subvert many traditional adventure and video game narratives, it's understandable that they would choose a defining trait that offers a very different perspective than most games give. This subversion would not have worked if the Bard wasn't a great character. A character that shows that what's important is what you do with the skills that you have, not what skills you have to begin with. Heroic actions define a hero, not their personality or traits and what some view as your greatest weaknesses are actually the opposite. The Bard's positivity is infectious, but it is certainly not universal, and that's the major difference between them and the most important ally they have, Miriam. Miriam is a cantankerous and cynical witch who routinely is annoyed by the Bard's attitude and actions. At first. Over time, more details of Miriam's history beliefs and personality come to the fore. She is definitely still cynical and grumpy, but if that was all she was, she would have given up on the journey long ago. Like the Bard, Miriam is extremely determined and courageous. She doesn't back down from a challenge and is very straightforward with her thoughts. She also has a strong sense of justice and what is right. That and her determination are what make the Bard and Miriam great allies and eventually friends, all their differences aside. Over time, as the Bard and Miriam develop trust, she then becomes more open about her feelings, especially about her feelings of inadequacy. Feelings that we see reflected in the Bard during their depression and their chat with Audrey. Imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern that happens when an individual doubts their accomplishments or talents and fears exposure as a fraud. This syndrome is becoming more commonly recognized, and I believe, again without any true mental health training, that all three of the Bard, Miriam, and Audrey exhibit signs of this syndrome. Miriam's symptoms, I believe, manifest in her cynicism, and a big part of her journey is finding her hope and trust for their cause and people outside of just her grandmother. 
Miriam and the Bard develop a tight friendship and become fierce defenders and supporters of each other throughout the latter half of the game. Make no mistake, without Miriam, the world wouldn't have been saved, demonstrated by her taking center stage during the final song. Miriam's journey serves as another example of the Bard's uncanny ability to connect with people, and reflects a lot of the Bard's worries and fears while giving great contrasting worldviews and personalities. But their similarities show what is really important to the Bard. Knowing what is right, and fighting for it with everything you have. Sometimes though, even your best efforts can't get through to someone. And yes, I am of course talking about Audrey Redheart. The hero is the ultimate contrast for the Bard. Where the Bard is kind, the hero is dismissive. Where the Bard is humble, the hero is entitled. And where the Bard is peaceful, the hero is violent. That's not to say that they are entirely contrasting. The scene when they are trapped shows that Audrey holds some of the same insecurities that the Bard and Miriam have. She wanted so badly to be noticed and appreciated before she became the hero, that once she did become the hero and got the notice, appreciation, and admiration she craved, she would do anything to keep it. Anything that would threaten her role as the hero in capital letters was an attempt to throw her back to the life she resented. That led to her animosity towards the Bard and Miriam, her rejection of the Rainbow Messenger when she suggested Audrey give the Bard a chance, and her ultimate breaking of her promise and almost destroying the world. It was in fact because she was the chosen one that she couldn't do what a real hero should have done. Audrey was unwilling, to put in the words of Lucina, to challenge her fate because this path was what gave her everything she dreamed of. She couldn't accept not being the hero, not being the special one, even though the Bard rightly pointed out that even without the title she would be special and could be a hero. She just wouldn't be the chosen one. Audrey is an amazing contrast to the Bard in so many ways, but like with the other contrast in Miriam, I find their similarities more fascinating. Neither Audrey nor the Bard really chose their role. They both had major insecurities about their role and their usefulness, and they both felt jerked about by the whims of forces greater than themselves. Ultimately, Audrey decided to let those forces dictate her actions, and the Bard thought complexly and decided to go their own path. Heroic actions defined who was a hero, and when given the chance to act in a heroic way, Audrey chose not to. Wandersong is a special game with an excellent, concise, and deep story that works so well because of all the characters talked about in this video. The linchpin of it, though, is the wonderful bard that shows the ups and downs, the joys and sorrows of life, and vows to keep striving to save the world against all odds. The bard is a special character on their own merits and as a different type of hero in the medium of video games. The bard shows that not everyone can become a true hero, but a true hero can come from anywhere. I hope you enjoyed this character journey and discussion about the Bard. If you did, please leave a like and comment below thoughts on the Bard, Wandersong, or the series in general. Let me know if you caught all four references in this video. Subscribe to keep following the channel, have a great day, and happy gaming.